Pastor Julie, I'm one of the pastors on staff here that oversees ministry and operations. If you're new, we are so glad, as Pastor Jeff said, for, to have you here um, and would love to get to know you. So I am gonna share with you a story that happened a few years ago. I was actually leading a trip, uh, retracing Paul's footsteps, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we were over in Greece and Turkey and Italy, getting to see where the epistles were written, getting to study them and absolutely beautiful scenery uh, with wonderful other believers. Uh, my boyfriend actually teases me about suffering for Jesus on a Mediterranean cruise, but <laughs> gotta go where the Lord calls you on the Lido deck, <laughs> studying the epistles, it was wonderful. In fact, uh, I've talked with the Schulers about the possibility of leading that trip here. It's kind of a part two to Israel of getting to retrust chase the footsteps of Jesus and then retrace the footsteps of Paul. So when I was on this trip, I'd purposely planned for extra room in my luggage because I knew I might be picking up a few souvenirs and gifts. And so I weighed my bag before I went, left room, but I underestimated a little bit how much I had purchased on the trip. And when I got, I was flying through Paris on my way home. And when I got to the counter to check in my bag, my main, care, my main bag was a little bit over. So my logical thought, I don't know, have any of you ever had a bag that's been over? Nobody's admitting this in church. <laughs> I won't raise my hand. But you know, they charge you like a crazy exorbitant fee. So I was like, there is no way I'm paying that. So I was like, I'll just take from my main bag and put it in my carry on. So I put it in my carry on. There was an extremely long line uh, for security that day, waited over an hour. Then when I get to the front, I had not read the fine print on my ticket. And did anybody know this, but Air France and many of the other European airlines, oh, somebody's already nodding their head. <laughs> They know where I'm going. They weigh your carry-on. So I get, you're only allowed to have 12 kilograms. I get up there. I think it's like three kilograms over, which is basically six and a half pounds. So I'm thinking I'm gonna have to bite the bullet and just check my bag in. But the lady says, oh, you can't do that now. You'd actually have to go back to the line to check your bag in at the other place. So you'd have to wait in this line for an hour. So my choice was miss my flight or throw away the things that were in my bag. So I was like, I'm not doing either of those. <laughs> there has got to be another option. Does anybody have any ideas what I did? <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys are great. So I felt like I had this like brilliant idea and the lady looked at me like I was absolutely crazy, but I think she wanted to see me do this. So she agreed because if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense because the exact same weight is still going on the plane, whether I'm wearing it or whether it's in my carry-on. But she was like, yeah, you want, if you want to try it, I will say most of the people in Paris were lovely, so kind, so hospitable. I do not know that I would use that same description of this lady. <laughs> so she's looking, I can tell she's mocking me. So I, of course, I'm trying to pull out the heaviest things. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen that episode of Friends where Joey puts on like five or six or seven layers of clothes. But that's essentially what I looked like. I was putting on layer after layer and every time I would put a layer on, she, oh my goodness. <laughs> let's let's um, not have to call security. Uh, she would weigh my bag and she would look at me and go, no. <laughs> So then I would pull, I would go to my bag and I had several jackets in there. So I put on numerous jackets. <laughs> then I started stuffing souvenirs and books in my pocket. <laughs> so it was getting thicker and thicker. And mind you, this is the middle of the summer and it's like, I'm like dripping sweat and there's a crowd that's gathered around me now that just were watching this for their own amusement thinking, oh, silly American. <laughs> so I think I put on two hats <laughs> and my charger, stuffing that in. And every time she weighed it, finally, I got it down to point two over. <laughs> And she looks at me and she goes, Veet, Veet, go, go. <laughs> so she let me go. But here I am, by this point, 
It had taken way longer than I expected. So I'm like running to my gate with like 10 layers of clothes on, (laughs) dripping with sweat, going, God, help me make my flight after that. Good news is I made my flight. Again, the same amount of uh, weight was still on there, but she, she let me through. So this week I actually had that story come back to my mind when I was thinking about our topic today because I feel like that God was showing me that this is actually a visual illustration of when we carry things that we were never meant to carry. And we're gonna be talking about unforgiveness and we're going to be talking about offense and how we carry things in the spirit and things in our heart that we were never designed to carry. And just like I am way down here with extra weight that I'm not meant to be carrying, I believe God is calling us to release some things that we have been carrying. And I don't know what it might be for you. It could be something that you would have to forgive your parent for, something that happened to you as a child, or maybe a way that they did not meet your needs that we're gonna release today. Maybe it's something that happened at work and it's more fresh and it's recent. Maybe it's you got passed over for a promotion or somebody else got credit for work that you did or you're carrying more than your fair share and you know you even have a low grade of offense that you're carrying. Maybe it's something that a friend or a family member said to you that pierced your heart and you knew came from a place of jealousy. Like we're gonna talk about uh, David today and how he walked through that. Maybe it's something that is with your spouse or your significant other that you need to lay down where you have the same fight over and over again and you don't feel seen in that place. Maybe it's something you need to forgive yourself for from the past or maybe it's something that you actually need to forgive or release offense to God in that place. Or maybe it's actually something that's heavier, that's something that's really hard to talk about that you know it caused you to create walls in your heart and you know is affecting even how you walk or interact in daily life or interact with others. We're gonna talk about how God gives us the grace to release the things that he is calling us to release so that we can walk in the way that we were intended to walk, so we can be in a place of full freedom. And so just wanna encourage you uh, to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Again, I know that this is a heavier, harder topic, and I'm gonna share even some things from my life that I feel like God has been challenging me in ways that he is asking me to walk through. We're gonna look today at the biblical foundation for forgiveness. We're going to look at the life of David. We're going to look at three different potential offenses that he had and how he walked through those. And then we're going to talk about practically how do you let God lead you through forgiveness? And it very much is a process and that we can be raw and real with God in that place. Uh, There was a study that was done recently that backs up what I believe the Bible teaches about Scripture. Don't y'all love it when there's scientific or psychological studies that prove what the Scripture has been teaching us for years? It's like, oh, this is proof that what the Bible teaches and how he's calling us to live is actually what we were meant. There's a study done where uh, some psychologists studied this area of forgiveness for years and years and studied different people that walked in it and then people that did not. And they found there was a strong correlation between between emotional health, mental health, physical health. And what was interesting about this study, I read an article this week about the, one of the primary psychologists. And just as he was getting ready to publish this data that he had spent, it was pretty much his lifetime's work studying this area of forgiveness, he encountered a tragedy himself. His mother was actually murdered by an intruder. And he was grappling with okay, I have all of this statistical data and analysis that is telling me why forgiveness is so important, why we should do it, but then he's absolutely hammered with a real life situation that he's like, there was nothing inside of me that wanted to live out. And I think that's a lot can be compared to us as Christians. On paper, the Bible, scripture, we know we're called to forgive. I don't think this is news probably to anybody in the room that you're like, oh, God calls us to forgive. But there's such a difference between reading these truths, hearing a sermon about these truths, and having to live these truths. 
And that's exactly what this psychologist, and he talks about the painful process that he walked through as he was publishing this to choose to forgive the intruder in that situation that had taken the life of his precious mother. And I believe God is calling us and confronting us with those same realities of what does it look like to live these truths out? So um, I'm gonna read a couple quotes for you that uh, help reemphasize the importance of forgiveness. Marian Williamson said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. How many of us do that? We feel like we're punishing the other person and often they don't even know we're upset at them or know there's anything going on and we're creating our own prison. Uh, Another quote says, it has been said that the person who most influences your life is the one you have not forgiven. Uh, We're gonna look at what scripture says. Uh, 206 times the Bible says to forgive or has some... um, variation of the word forgiveness, a call for us to forgive. And uh, it really is an opportunity for us to show the character of Christ. I think people living out forgiveness is actually a way better sermon than I'll ever preach because you're getting to see in real life where the rubber meets the road, the incredibly hard, painful decision that they have made to to, to choose to follow the commands of Christ in that place. Uh, I was researching for this message and came across some incredible stories of forgiveness. Uh, One of them was a mother whose son was killed in a drunk driving accident and she was able to go to the family of that son and she was able to offer forgiveness and through that situation, they actually came to Christ. They were able to receive the tangible love in a place, unlikely relationship that you would never expect Uh, a man named Wilbert Jones, who had been wrongfully in prison for 45 years. I mean, can you imagine that? Like hard enough 45 days, but 45 years waking up every single morning, going to bed every single night, knowing you did not do what you were in prison for. And I saw him interviewed, and the only way that I can describe it is the joy of God was radiating from his face. He said the only way that I am able to forgive is through Christ. And he talked about how he had an encounter in prison with the love of God and that his heart had been in a place of bitterness and anger. And then through that encounter, he was able to forgive the authorities that had put him there. And to add insult to injury, he actually found out that the authorities had purposely withheld information so that he would look guilty in that situation and he was still able to forgive them. Many of you have heard of Desmond Tutu and his testimony. He has an incredible testimony in his role in South Africa, but he talks about a personal testimony where he forgave his father for abuse uh, that he witnessed of his mother. And he talks about how painful it was and talks about how he had to forgive himself too for wishing he would have done more and stood up more and tried to protect his mother. He talks about how he was going home to South Africa to reconcile with his father and again, Reconcile does not mean restoration. Uh, There's a difference, and we'll unpack that a little bit more. It does not mean that you're necessarily supposed to go back into the same type of relationship or that the relationship is gonna look the same, but he wanted to hear his dad's heart. So he goes home, and his dad invites him to come over that night, and he said, you know what? I'm really tired from the flight. Let's talk tomorrow. And his father passes away that night. And so they never had to, he never got to hear his father apologize, but he said, still in that place, I chose to forgive him because sometimes one of the hardest things is choosing to forgive when you never hear an apology. Many of you will never hear I'm sorry for the things that were done or even an acknowledgement of it in that place. Uh, Lisa Turkhurst, who is a women's Bible study writer, uh, wrote a book that is called Forgiving What You Cannot Forget, which is actually my subtitle. And she has a powerful Bible study and tells uh, the story of her husband being unfaithful to her for years and the deep hurt, but the restoration process that she went through in forgiveness of him. Uh, And then I actually had a woman come up to me after first service and she gave me permission to share this. Uh, But she just shared about how when she was eight years old that she was molested. So you just never know what people are walking through. She told me her story 
of forgiving the man who had done this to her, but just what a long process it was and just what a deep place that hid inside of her heart. But she talked about through coming to Christ, that was part of her testimony, how she was able to forgive this man and the, and the pain and the burden she was able to release to God. And again, it doesn't mean that there wasn't deep hurt there. And she talked about for years and years, even though she had forgiven, it still affected her. It affected her marriage. It affected her relationships. So sometimes it's having to forgive again and over in that process. I've heard many of your stories uh, from even part of being a counselor here at church. And I, my heart breaks with some of the stories that I've heard, the things that you have walked through. And again, some of the beautiful portraits of forgiveness in those places. But I also wanna acknowledge and validate you go, any of you that are still in that process. Um, I was talking with somebody this morning and they said, forgiveness is sometimes the hardest thing that we will ever do. I feel like it is sometimes the most costly act of worship Again, we know that there is a benefit to us in the process, but it also doing it out of obedience to God and knowing that it doesn't mean that what they did didn't hurt us. It doesn't mean that there's not real pain, there wasn't real wrongdoing. It doesn't even mean that you don't seek justice and want, uh, we're gonna talk about the life of David and how he prayed Psalm 54 and he said, God, annihilate my enemies. How many of you wanna quote that instead of Jesus forgive them for they know not what they do? I'm like, can I quote Oh, David, I'm just kind of, I mean, they're both scripture, Lord. <laughs> Surely I can quote him in that place. Very real. I believe Peter wrestled with that. We see this in Matthew 18, 22. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, thinking Peter is like, I am being super generous if somebody wrongs me seven times. I mean, think about that over and over seven times forgiving them each time. And what does Jesus answer? He says, no, 70 times seven, meaning that when you look at that number in the Greek, it actually means an infinite number of times. That's what it meant in their culture. And so Jesus is saying, you forgive and you forgive and you keep on forgiving. Ephesians 4.32 connects the reason why we give says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. And then Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may hear your prayers. The word offense is used 25 different times in scripture and it's actually warned against. Uh, it's even a sign of the end times in Matthew 24 where it says the love of many will grow cold and their hearts will become offended. When you look at the Greek word for offense, it is scandalous, which means trap or snare. So if you think about a trap or a snare, it's set on purpose to try to catch an animal or whatever you're trying to catch in something. And I believe the enemy sets traps or snares in our life and wants us to fall into that place of offense. And when you look, um, John Bevere says that he thinks Offense is actually one of the most common sins in the church and reminds us that we can even have a low grade of offense without even realizing it. So it's not just a forgiving major offenses, but even those smaller ones that where we've distanced somebody's, our heart from somebody or we have written somebody off because of what they've done rather than confronting what is going on in our heart and doing the hard, hard work of working through it. Uh, he says, trials in this life will expose what is in our heart, whether the offense is toward God or to others. Tests either make you bitter towards God or your peers are stronger. If you pass the test, the roots will shoot down deeper, stabilizing you and your future. So we're gonna look at how David walked this out. Uh, C3, which is representing back there, uh, is actually studying the life of David this semester. So we're gonna uh, dive in with them and look at how David had the opportunity to walk these out. Uh, the first one is... Um, where David had the opportunity to let go of an offense towards other. Can anybody think of anybody that David had to forgive or let go of an offense in scripture? Oh, is that because you heard it first service? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you just know the Bible. Uh, Saul, and I'll give you just a quick background. Uh, David had been 
anointed to be the future leader of Israel. Um, And then he had beat Goliath. And then Saul had invited him into the palace to play music for him. And during this season, uh, Saul loved David. He was so thankful for him. But something happened where when they went off to war, he actually got incredibly jealous of him and totally turned against him. And it says that the people started chanting, Saul killed thousands, but David killed tens of thousands. And so Saul got incredibly gripped with jealousy to the point that he starts pursuing to kill David. Jonathan helps him escape and he's running for his life. And that's where we pick up in this first passage. First Samuel 24, eight through 12 says, then David went out to the cave and called out to Saul, My lord, the king, when Saul looked at him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said, Saul, why do you listen to these men that say, David is bent on hurting you? The day you have seen uh, with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands and care. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared your life. I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of rope in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down. May the Lord judge between you. And if you really pay attention to this next line, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done for me, but my hands will not touch you. So we see, as I mentioned previously uh, in the Psalms, David really wrestling with forgiveness. He's probably one of the ones that prays the most dramatic prayers of annihilating or taking out his enemies. But you can see in this passage, he comes to a place of understanding that it's actually the Lord's to avenge. That is, we are releasing the person into God's hands. We're not letting them off the hook. We're releasing them into God's hands. It's hard to fully understand justice, the side of heaven, because sometimes, we see the principle of sowing and reaping lived out where there is repercussions, but many times we don't. And David even talks about it in the Psalms and he's like, how long are you gonna let this go, Lord, where those that are scoffing you and mocking you and mocking me are prospering. And so when we look at it through the lens of just seeing the side of heaven, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel fair. But it also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, that we will stand before God and give an account for our life for everything we have done. And I don't fully understand God's justice system, but I also know that he is the definition of justice and that we can trust him, that we can release that person to him. We see this uh, in the story of Corrie ten Boom. How many of you are familiar with Corrie ten Boom? Oh, many of you. She lived during the Holocaust and actually got to go visit her house in Amsterdam. She had a wall, that the fake wall that they had built up where they were hiding Jews behind that wall because they knew that it grieved God's heart the way that Jews were being treated during the Holocaust. And they risked their lives in order to house Jews. But one of their close family friends actually ended up betraying them in that situation. And her whole family got sent to a concentration camp at Ravensbrook. And while she was there, she talks about in her book, The Hiding Place, that one of the Jews was especially cruel to her sister and to her. He would make them parade naked in front of them and say horrible things to him. They were starving. They were just treated incredibly inhumanely. And unfortunately, her sister actually ends up passing away in the concentration camp, but Corey is freed afterwards. And she knows that her life message, her mandate from God is actually to go to Germany and to preach and to teach to those that had been those that had put them in captivity and share the gospel message and share about God's forgiveness. So she's in Munich, Germany one night and she's preaching this message of God's forgiveness, how he throws our sins as deep as the sea and out of the corner of her eye, guess who she sees? that concentration guard camp. She was like, I knew in a moment exactly who he was. An overweight man in a trench coat, balding, and she had to get through the rest of her message, and guess who comes up to see her afterwards? He comes up and he stands and he said, I've become a Christian, and he extends his hand for her to shake his hand. She said there was absolutely nothing inside of her that wanted to lift her hand. She's like, I know I just preached this beautiful message on forgiveness, but as we said earlier, it's a 
lot easier to preach it than it is to live it when it hits the places of our deepest pain and our deepest disappointments. So she said in that moment, I couldn't lift my hand. Like, I didn't know what to do. And so she said it probably was only a few seconds, but it felt like a few minutes where she was grappling. And she just said, God, if you want me to do this, you're gonna have to give me the strength to do this. And she said in that moment, what she can only describe as the love of God came over her, where she said not only did she reach out to shake his hand, but she actually hugged the man. And she said she felt like she felt God's heart over him. She was like, I knew it had nothing to do with me. My flesh wanted to continue to despise him and recount what he had done to my sister. But in that moment, I felt the love of God over him in that place. And I think that's such a powerful story because it reminds us what God is calling us to do, he, he will give us the strength. Now, unfortunately, when I've been called to forgive, I don't always have that experience where the love of God rushes over me for the person. <laughs> I will say after time, after I pray over the person and repent and, and try to get God's heart, sometimes it'll come a little bit more, but it's not typically this rushing wave of, oh, I just felt God's heart over you. <laughs> But sometimes I know God shows up like that and I know that as we are faithful to do what he calls us to do, he will give us what we need to do. It Just like the expression I've said up here many times, where he guides, he will provide. He will give you the strength. Uh, again, and it might be a long process. Even as the woman from first service shared, it took years and years and years to walk through that. Uh, a story from my own life that I felt like God wanted me to share was several years ago, I helped plant a church. And I've never shared this story publicly before, but I felt like God wanted me to share this morning about um, the church that we had planted and then what happened with it. So there was numerous of us that moved up to this area. There were 17 of us that helped plant this church back in 2007. The beginning of the church honestly felt like we were living out the book of Acts. You're like, with your best friends, you're seeing God move, you're seeing people get baptized, you're seeing marriages be restored, you're seeing um, just God move in incredible ways. And the church grew exponentially, even to the point that we didn't have the leadership to sustain it. Numerous years in, it got unhealthier and healthy, particularly in the core leadership. And then the head leader started to a place that I would call significant emotional unhealth, where he started making decisions that were just poor. And it got to the place where we knew we had to go to our overseers. We had tried to reach out to them once earlier, and they kind of told us just to work it out internally. But then we came back and I was actually one of the ones that had to confront him and he was one of my best friends. Something when you plan a church you never expect to happen. And they, our overseers actually came in and ended up deciding that he was not in a place to lead anymore. And what I can only describe next is a train wreck. There was so much hurt, so much relational fallout, so much brokenness and misunderstanding. When things like that happen in the church and amongst believers, I feel like it's extra hard to understand because you're like, this is not how it's meant to be. But there's real things that people are grappling with. The overseers ended up bringing in new leadership and I honestly was thankful for that in the beginning because I was like, we need leadership. I wanna you know, help rebuild, help restore. Most of my closer friends had left at that point, but I so clearly felt like God was calling me to stay and to walk it out with the people that were still there. And the next season actually ended up being even more painful for me. I was very much sidelined in that next season. And I think they honestly thought I was gonna leave because they just were like, oh, if we continue to take stuff from her. Uh, you know, I was not asked to speak. I was, ministries that I was overseeing were taken away. The only explanation I was ever given was, you can't build the new with the old. <laughs> Definitely, I was the old. <laughs> and in that place, I feel like God did something inside of me that even though I would have never chosen those circumstances, the character of Christ was formed in me in a different way than I had experienced before. I felt like God told me to come into the office every day with joy, which was not easy. And I definitely did not do it perfectly. So I had my flesh moments for sure. Um, but they put me in a cubicle that was right next to the office or right next to the conference room where they were having all the meetings and I had been on the executive team before. So I would hear them laughing and joking and planning. And it almost felt like the analogy of when you have to give up a child for adoption because the church very much felt like 
something I'd helped birth and lead for many years. And then it feels like an open adoption where you're watching somebody else parent or lead and have Nick nodding. We walked through that together as well as several others in the room. And in that place, I felt like God said, you're called to be a bridge and just to continue to love and to trust me in the process. One day I heard as clearly as I've ever heard God, be faithful where you are and I will open the more. And you know, when you hear something like that, you think it's gonna be the next day. Uh, it was, <laughs> you're like, okay, the more is coming. Thank you, Lord. It was a year and a half, a year and a half after that that he ended up releasing me from that situation. But I'd always preached that there's gold that you can find in harder seasons that you can't find in easy seasons. And I was determined to find the gold. Be careful what you preach because God has a way of making you live that out. And some like forgiveness stuff come up this week that I was like, oh, I'm just gonna preach about manifesting God's goodness. And maybe that's what I'll have to live out. Um, but a side note is during that season is actually when I met my boyfriend, Craig. Um, we met in the church parking lot. And if I hadn't stayed in that place and walked in obedience, I don't think that our paths would have crossed in the same way where we continued to run into each other. He became very much a rock to me during that time and a safe place for me to walk through that. Uh, and also another divine appointment that happened during that time. Within a week of knowing that I was gonna be leaving, so a year and a half after I got the fun prophetic word, within a week, I got reconnected with the Schulers, and I had not seen them in years and years, and God reconnected our past, and within a week, I was on staff here. And so it talks about in actually Joseph's story that the suddenly comes, but it's usually years and years and years of walking out before those suddenly comes. And so just wanna say for any of you that have been walking through hurt from another believer or hurt from another, that God wants to meet you in that place. And if you're still in a raw place in that, that's okay too. Uh, as we've said numerous times, forgiveness very much is a process and he wants to meet you in that place. Uh, we have a pastoral care team and would be honored to walk through that with you or we also have uh, licensed counselors that we can point you to in that place. Um, but just wanted to let you know that you're not, you don't have to walk through that alone and that God wants to meet you in that place. The next um, point is that God wants us to let go of offenses towards ourself. And I think that sometimes those can actually be the hardest um, because we will recount things that we've done in the past or uh, I've shared my testimony some in here before. I had a lot to forgive myself of when I first became a Christian or things, when I look back at even that situation that I just shared with you, there's things that I definitely wish I would have done differently and then you play out. If I had done those things, would things have gone differently? Um, we get to see how David modeled this. Uh, as we know, I appreciate that uh, the Bible includes the dysfunctions of the families in Scripture. It could feel like real housewives of D.C. sometimes when you're reading Scripture, where you're like, oh, well, this is a little bit juicier than I realized of. Look at all of this that is happening and all the different ways that people are interconnected and sleeping with each other. And we get to see how David uh, actually sleeps with Bathsheba. And then he was part of the plot to murder her husband. Uh, but Psalm 51 is where we really see him come before the Lord. And I think there's a direct correlation between forgiving ourselves and receiving God's forgiveness. Because uh, God showed me in my own life, it's actually pride to not forgive myself when he has forgiven me, when he has extended that free gift. So we see David in Psalm 51 say, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast from me your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. So I just encourage you to even see, sometimes we know there's unforgiveness we're carrying towards ourselves, but sometimes there's a fence that we don't even realize that we're carrying. So even taking time this week, uh, it might be something you're even currently struggling with. 
If anybody has ever told you or made you feel like you have to have your life all together to come to church, that is not the gospel and that is not our heart here. Whether it's something you struggled with in the past or it's something that you are currently struggling with, so often people can put on masks and feel like they have to have their lives all together when in reality, we are all struggling. We are all wrestling. We are all seeking to become more like Christ, but we're definitely all falling short too. So no matter whatever you've struggled with in the past or whatever you're currently struggling with. Maybe it's addiction, maybe it's control, maybe it's perfectionism, maybe it's pornography or some other sexual sin. Maybe it's a place of performance or dishonesty or ways that you know that you're carrying shame or pride or materialism or any way that you're disappointed in yourself, just to know that God absolutely loves you in that place. He sees you. I believe if you're in church right now or you're listening online, God sees the yes that's in your heart. You would not choose to wake up and come to this place if there was not something inside of you that loved him. So just because you're wrestling in that place, God doesn't define us by our issues. He defines us by what's in our heart. And I believe that God wants to meet us in that place. Just as we see in John chapter eight, that's the woman that was caught in adultery and all of the religious leaders are persecuting her and scoffing at her. And what does Jesus do? She's actually on the floor and he comes down and he gets down on her level and he looks her in the eye and says, I do not condemn you. And I just want you to know that God is saying that over you today, neither do I condemn you. He also, the next part of that story says, he calls her to more. And so it's not that we're meant to stay in that place of brokenness. It's not meant to stay in that habitual sin, but it also to know the father heart of God in us in that place that we are absolutely loved, that we are adored and that he wants to empower us. He wants to bring healing and freedom in our life so we can walk just like that Samaritan woman into the fullness of what God has for us. Uh, And then last but not least, and I know this one can be harder to let go of offense towards God. I think some of the deepest hurts can be in this place because it's so hard to understand why God doesn't answer certain prayers. I mean, I feel like if we had us raise our hands, every single one of us would say, we don't understand why God didn't move in a particular way in a particular situation where it feels like it so clearly lines up with his heart and his nature that we read about. So it feels baffling, it feels like a mystery. Uh, Some of my dear friends, Mitch and Katie Luce, uh, several years ago actually lost their daughter right before her third birthday. And walking through that situation with them and walking through them dealing with that pain and that place um, of potential offense in their heart and not understanding why after prayer and fasting and seeking him, why God didn't heal their little girl and having to see the other side of that and just the disappointment and hurt. There are very real places. And so when I stand up here and preach about forgiveness, I never want to underestimate, again, how hard that can be and what, again, costly it is. David says in Psalm, or sorry, in 2 Samuel 24, 24, I will not offer the Lord that which costs me nothing. And I think sometimes worshiping him in those places of loss and disappointment and confusion can be the most costly worship that there is and the hardest thing that maybe we ever do. Um, we're gonna look at, Uh, 2 Samuel 12, David actually lost a child too. It says, David got up from the ground after he washed and put on lotions. He went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food. And after he lost his child, he still went to God's house and worshiped. And I love the beauty of that passage, but it's also, I think, a hard passage because sometimes it's not that quick. Sometimes you're not in a place of significant loss and then you're able, it's really hard to go and be able to worship. And so just to know that God honors the process that you're walking through, that you can be absolutely raw and real with him in that place, that he will meet you. And I will tell you, I've never messed up in this area. I've put theology sometimes more important than people's hearts. And I was wrong in that place. And I feel like God even showed me that at a deeper level this week. And so just as your pastor, as your friend, as a fellower seeker of Christ, 
uh, wherever you are in that place, God wants to meet you with tenderness. God wants to meet you with love. He wants to uh, he allow that pain that you're feeling um, to be brought to him. Uh, of course, we see as we're looking at these passages um, that just as we saw in the Corey Ten Boom story, that we can ask God for help, that we can ask him to meet us in there. If you're in a place, one of the prayers that one of the saints prayed in history was, God, make me willing to be willing. If you don't feel like you're there yet, and with Corey Ten Boom, God, I don't have it in me to forgive this person, but I'm willing to let you lead me through this process. Um, another practical way of working through offense is allowing your heart to feel the pain. If you try to skip over the pain, it's gonna resurface. Forgiveness is never negating the pain. It's never trying to minimize the pain. It's never trying to push away the pain. It is seeing the pain in that place and also telling your story. And I know that doesn't always feel easy, but your story, one, not only brings healing in your own life, but you never know how God will use that in other people's life too. Even the woman first service who told me her story, I was in tears as she was sharing it with me. Uh, and then number three, remember that there is a difference between forgiveness and restoration. And we are not called to be in the same relationship. In fact, sometimes it's not healthy or wise to. So sometimes we can wrongly equate forgiveness with restoration of relationship, meaning that we are back in the same type of relationship that we had before. There's relationships in my life that I feel like I'm not restored. Maybe one day they will be, but where they currently are now, I don't feel like it's healthy or wise. But I'm just responsible for my heart before God and to be willing to walk through that forgiveness process. And then fourth, forgiveness is a choice, but it's also a process just as we've said many times. Jesus, of course, is our ultimate role model in forgiving when they've done nothing wrong. I imagine Jesus on the cross saying something like this, in my greatest hour of need, my closest friends deserted me. Judas betrayed me, Peter denied me, and the rest fled for their lives. Only John followed from afar. I had cared for them for over three years, feeding them and teaching them. Yet as I died for the sins of the world, I forgave. I released all of them from my friends who had deserted me to the Roman guard who had crucified me. They didn't ask for forgiveness, yet I freely gave it. And so just want to encourage you with just some practical next steps. Um, I was a teacher for many years and I'm a even seminary professor now, so I love to give homework. Uh, so you guys can take out your pen and paper. I'll, I'll be taking it up next week. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm going to give you some recommended reading for anybody that's interested. There's actually many phenomenal books on the topic of forgiveness, but a few that I read and then um, read through. Jesus's forgiveness is found in Luke 23. Um, what we just summarized there about how how he was called to forgive those who didn't even acknowledge their wrong. Uh, then Genesis 37 through 50 actually almost used the life of Joseph because uh, it's so such a phenomenal testimony of having to forgive again and again and again. He had to forgive his brothers. He had to forgive Potiphar. He had to forgive Potiphar's wife. He had to forgive the cupbearer who forgot him. And then, of course, the ultimate at the end, we see this beautiful restoration. And I always love the end of those. I love the book of Job, the end. But then you're also like, he also had to walk through a really long, really hard process for many, many, many years to get to this shining moment at the end. And you're like, does it even feel worth it? But we get to see how that choice uh, actually set Israel up for their future, uh, how they were in the land of Egypt because of the dream that Joseph had had, where he had predicted that there would be seven years of famine and seven years of feasting. And so that actually set the scene for Moses to deliver the people from Israel. So you see how there's years and years and years of repercussions to our decisions, that our decisions do not only affect us. And I think about even my uh, silly analogy in the beginning where I had all the clothes on, the weight that I was carrying in the plane 
did not only affect me, every single other passenger had that weight, whether they realized it or not. And those that are closest to you, whether they articulate it or not, are feeling the repercussions of offense or unforgiveness in your life. Even from the stance of you not walking in all that God has for you, because there's things that are on the other side of that when you're able to walk in the fullness of freedom that God has for you. And again, He will meet you in that place and self-compassion as it is a process. Um, the Bait of Satan is the book I mentioned earlier, uh, John Bevere, Forgiving My Father, Forgiving Myself is... Uh, Billy Graham's daughter, Ruth Graham, she has a powerful testimony in there. Uh, Lisa Turkhurst is the one I mentioned earlier, forgiving what you can't forget. Uh, spending time in prayer, asking if there's anyone you need to forgive. Again, I believe the Holy Spirit will highlight and show you. Some of it, as soon as I started preaching, you knew exactly who you needed to forgive or that you're still in process. Others of you, I believe the Holy Spirit, and this includes me, God brought up things that I need to forgive or release that I didn't even realize I was still caring. But God in his kindness in the right way and right time will show us so that we can walk in that full freedom. Ask God if there's any steps he wants you to take. Journal, not everybody loves journaling, but I have found it extremely helpful in even pronouncing God's forgiveness or he'll bring back to mind different memories of things that happen. So you can make a blank decision to forgive, but often it, there's many instances that come up that'll be specific things that you need to forgive that person for. So you can either, one counselor recommends writing them all out in a card or a journal. Another way to do it, which is how I more often do it, it's just as the Holy Spirit will bring them up because the Holy Spirit will bring them up or certain events will trigger them to where you're like, oh, that hits that place. Uh, and then reach out for help. I mentioned pastoral counseling, um, Christian counseling, or even just sharing your story with a friend. Pastor Bill is getting ready to preach a sermon on sharing your story. And of course, we love to hear the highlights and testimonies or amazing things where God came through. But just as important, if not more important, I think is to share those places of brokenness, those places of disappointment, those places of pain so that we can walk with each other through those places. And then last but not least, staying sensitive to the Holy Spirit in that place. So as we close, I just want to address two groups. Uh, for any of you that may have either not surrendered your life to God or that you're in a place where you know God is calling you to recommit your life to Him, that you, if you're honest with yourself, are not walking as closely with Him in this season as you have in another season, I'm gonna give us an opportunity to recommit our lives to Christ and to receive the gospel message. Forgiveness is one of the core tenets of Scripture where we see how God sent His Son to reconcile a broken people to himself and is able to give us complete forgiveness in that place. And then I'm also gonna talk to a group of people, which I believe is many of us, including myself, that you know in your heart, there's still some more hard heart work to do, but that you're saying, God, I wanna let you lead me in that place. I want all that you have for me. I wanna be willing to forgive, or I wanna even be willing to take some time this week and say, God, search my heart. Uh, is there anybody, anything, even if it's him, even if it's um, yourself, but just being, again, sensitive to the Holy Spirit in that place. So if you'll bow your heads with me. Father God, we do worship you in this place and just thank you that you're a God of abundant, gracious forgiveness. We just thank you for what you have, what you have restored in humanity, God, how it was always your plan, even from the fall, to send your son Jesus to restore us to yourself. Uh, if there's anybody here that wants to accept that gift of Jesus Christ or wants to recommit their life to Christ, if you'll raise your hand now, God sees you in this place. So if you'll pray with me, I see your hand in the back too. If you'll pray with me and uh, I just encourage all of us to say this prayer, even if it is us renewing uh, our heart before God. God, we thank you for your free gift of forgiveness and sending Jesus, your son. We accept this gift and give you leadership of our lives. Thank you for covering everything that I've ever done and restoring me to yourself. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. 
And then the second group, if you're in that group where you would say, I know I still have some heart work to do in the area of forgiveness, or I know that there's somebody, or I know there's offense, or if you're even in a place of saying, I wanna spend time before God this week asking him if there's any. If that is you, if you will raise your hand and I would love to pray over you. Thank you. I see your hands all around the room. This is a just tender moment before God. He sees you. He sees your pain. He does not discount it. Your pain matters deeply to God. Your story matters to God. I believe God is grieved over so many of the things that happened to you and that he wants to come and meet you in that place. He wants to bring healing in that place. So God, I just pray over each and every person. God, I pray over those that have their hand raised and we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help lead us in this area of forgiveness, of letting go of offense. God, I say that over my own life, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that they would feel, again, the kindness and tenderness of the Lord in that place to know that you see them. God, even if there is a fence towards you or um, something that they're carrying over themselves, God, or something that they're carrying towards others, I just pray even those that raise their hand of saying that they wanna spend time this week, God, if there's anything that you need to reveal, Lord, we thank you that you reveal what you wanna heal. And so we just say yes to that today, God, and give you full leadership of our lives in that place. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus Christ's powerful and holy name.